Good morning. I'm going to start right in with the gospel lesson this morning. I made a mistake when I printed the worship notes. I'm actually going to be reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 27. So if you'd like to um, follow along in your Bible, I will give you a minute to go from John to Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. That same day, this is still Easter morning, or well, this is afternoon, but this is still Easter day, the first Easter. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. That scripture, that's one of my personal favorites. What an opportunity that would have been of all the places I'd like to be in the Bible is to be walking with them when Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining himself from all of the scriptures, all the things concerning himself. That must have been the best lecture ever. Um, we're going to move on now. Our focus this morning is, is looking at um, what do we see when God tells us what to expect, do we see what God really promises or does what's real, what's around us seem more, more real, more likely, and even sometimes more desirable than the vision of God's blessings or the familiar world that we see around us? Sometimes God's promises are so um, amazing that they are hard to, um, hard to grasp. together. Gracious God, we want to hear your fresh word and not the echoes of our own assumptions. We want to see the new things that you are doing, looking past the limits that we set for ourselves. We want to know that you are here. We want to live in the power of your love. We lift our hearts, our prayers, and our lives to you in this moment. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue our trek with uh, the people of Israel in the wilderness. And we're now in Numbers chapter 13. Verses uh, for Numbers 13 through 14, 4. It's a little bit longer, but we have time. And um, there's some wonderful and uh, amazing stories in the Old Testament. So let's share this story together now. The Lord now said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel, 
from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. Now I will spare you the list of all of the tribes and all of the individuals whom he chose and move down to verse 27, or no, I guess that's 17. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near Lebo Hamath. When they came to the valley of Eskel, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of the pomegranates and figs. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the first fruits they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. The people began to complain, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let us go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other man, men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted amongst themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray now together again. Lord, we ask that you will um, open up the story of the people of Israel in the wilderness and help us to recognize who we are, help us to recognize who you are, and help us to recognize how best to order our lives so that we walk in your way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a few things that are very odd about preaching on Facebook Live. Number one, I'm looking at myself Number two, nobody says amen. Nobody says thanks be to God. Nobody even says the Lord's Prayer with me. That's very strange. I can't wait to see everybody back again. Nonetheless, it's still Easter. It's the third Sunday of Easter. The season of Easter lasts from 
um, Easter morning, that first Easter morning through Pentecost. So we're really only about halfway there as far as Easter goes. And our gospel lesson this morning um, was a continuation of the story of that one day. It's still um, the first resurrection Sunday as the disciples meet Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And the disciples are still befuddled. They don't quite get it. They say, well, the women said this, and then some of our, dis our, our number went and, and said, yes, the tomb was empty, but we don't understand um, what's going on. Some of them even said they saw Jesus in the upper room, but, but, but we're just going to go home because we don't know what else to do. God does make extravagant promises. God makes promises that are, if not improbable, sometimes even impossible. And one of those promises is fulfilled on resurrection morning. When Jesus is raised from the dead, God does the one thing that is surely impossible. And yet God has done it. And on, in that moment when Christ is raised from the dead, we recognize two things. That God has the purpose to do for us what we need, to care for us, to love us, no matter how we respond. And God has the power to do those things that are promised. The power to fulfill every promise. So if God has the purpose and God has the power to do all of the things um, that God promises, we can rely on that in every moment. That moment, that Easter moment, that resurrection moment is the key to our faith. We believe that God can and does do the things that God promises. Um, and in our story this morning, we run across another promise that God made. I don't know if you're paying close attention, but the story begins with God saying, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to move you into this land of Canaan. It seemed unlikely, perhaps, but you know, at this point, God has already, first of all, delivered the people from Egypt. Secondly, given them manna in the desert, making food out of nothing. And yet they're still ready to say, oh my goodness, you brought us out into the desert. You brought us out into the wilderness only to, to kill us, to make us suffer, to starve us to death. Maybe we would have been better off in Egypt. Come on, let's go back to what we knew. Let's go back to what was familiar. Let's go back to the place where we knew what to expect. And again, God makes another promise. God says, okay, we're going to take it even a little bit further. I've delivered you from slavery. I've fed you day by day by day. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to move you into this land flowing with milk and honey. God said, that's what I'm going to do. And he told Moses to send some people to explore the land. So Moses did. He um, gave much more specific instructions, much more extensive instructions. He didn't just say, go explore the land. He said, I want you to see how many people live there and where they live and what kind of towns they live in. I want you to see what the, what the harvest is like, what the land is like, um, what the landscape is like. I want you to bring back as many details as you can and even some of the produce of the land if possible. And the scouts came back with a glowing report. They said it is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's a bunch of grapes and they had to have two of them carry it on a pole between them because it was so big and so heavy. Um, they said, yes, there are people there. Yes, they're big. Um, some of them are even giants and, and all those things are true. Um, but the land that God has promised to us is a huge land and it, and it has um, enough for everyone and more. But then the discussion among the people shifted away from what God has promised to what we can do. Did you notice that shift? 
in the story, they begin to say, well, we can conquer this land. That's not the point. God has said God is going to give it to you. And then the others said, well, we can't conquer this land. They're giants. They're warriors. They're scary. We're not going to go in there and get killed and have our women and children carted off as slaves. We might as well go back to Egypt. At least there we knew what was going on. We might as well go back there now. Let's, let's, let's get rid of Moses. He keeps telling us to do these crazy things. And let's go back to what we know. We can't. Well, that's true. They couldn't, not in their own strength, not in their own understanding. And in fact, they didn't for 40 years. They spent the next 40 years wandering around in the wilderness because rather than relying on what God had said that God would do, this is what I'm going to do for you. They fell back to, well, we can't do that. It's too much. It's too, um, it's too challenging. It's just too dangerous. We can't do that. Now, it's a long ago and a faraway story. But on the other hand, it is a story about people behaving the way that people always do. That is always the temptation. God has said, this is what I am doing. We have the resurrection as the foundation of our faith in God fulfilling the promises that God makes. And yet still we back off. We say, oh, I don't know if we can do that. Well, no, we can't. It's not about us. It's about God. Well, I don't know if we have enough. I don't know if we really should. I don't know if that would be um, the prudent thing to do. Well, no, it's not the prudent thing to do. It's the faithful thing to do. It's not about what we can do. It's about what God can do. Now, of course, these things always have to be balanced. Scripture tells us, yes, you need to make plans. Yes, you need to understand. But in the final analysis at the end, it's always about what God is doing the best that we can do is go along with the plans that God lays out for us and not let ourselves get sidetracked into that same conversation that the people of Israel got sidetracked in, which is, can we do it? God has promised. We need to remind ourselves of that because we are people and we can't help getting turned aside by our fears, by our concerns. It happens. It's real. It's human. But we can choose to recalculate every time we find ourselves getting on track, to recalculate and turn back and say, wait a minute, okay, what has God promised? What is God doing? How do I participate in what God is doing? And that's why Sunday is so important. And our Sundays are not what they used to be. Our Sundays probably will be different going forward, but we can't give up our Sundays. We can't give up that return again and again, at least once a week. To remember who God is, to remember what God does, to remember that we're invited to participate in the wonderful things that God is doing in the world to recalculate our course and remember that God does what God says one way or another. God did bring the people into the land of Canaan just like God promised. Now it was 40 years later because the people were blocked from entering into the land by their own fears. But nonetheless, in spite of the people of Israel, God did what God had promised for the people of Israel. And nevertheless, God, in spite of ourselves, does what God promises for us. There's one promise I'd like to refresh for us this morning. God has promised in the words of Jesus Christ, I am with you always even to the end of time. He doesn't promise everything will be easy. 
doesn't promise there won't be any suffering or struggle, but God has promised that God will be with us to accompany us, to walk with us every moment, every day from now until the end of time. This is the same God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and that's impossible. This is the same God who brought the people of Israel into the land of Canaan in spite of themselves. And that was very difficult. It's not impossible. God is with us even now. I saw a quote about the power of resurrection and I wanna share it this morning and also ask a question. Living in the power of resurrection means refusing to accept that anything that is broken will ultimately remain broken. What does it mean to you to live in the power of resurrection? Living in the power of resurrection means there is no enemy which cannot be defeated. Living in the power of resurrection means that God's purpose is being accomplished in spite of the circumstances around us. Living in the power of resurrection means that God is with us in every moment, in every struggle, in every fear, in every anxiety about what's going to happen next, in every moment of wondering how long is this going to go on. God is with us. That's the promise, and what God promises, God does. Ask yourself this morning, what does it mean to me to live in the power of resurrection? What is it that I need to take and put in that place of resurrection and then in the power of God who can do the impossible? What does resurrection mean to me this morning? Um... Let's take some time to consider what God has done for us and to think again about what God, um, what we can do um, to cooperate, what we can do to walk with God, what we can do to, to reach out and, and participate in um, the opportunities that God has put in front of us. The people of Israel finally got there. They finally got around to the place where they were cooperating, and they finally did make it to the land of Cana. And at one point when they were building the temple, they actually all got eager and excited and, and really um, poured themselves into doing the work that God had called them to do. In um, Exodus chapter 35, we read this. So the people of Israel... Every man and woman who was eager to help in the work the Lord had given them through Moses brought their gifts and gave them freely to the Lord. What gifts are you going to bring to the Lord today? Are there ways that you can reach out and help in the community around you? We have seen so many examples of um, thoughtfulness and helpfulness and, and the joy that comes from helping each other. We can keep doing that. We can keep doing that even after we're allowed back out into the world. Um, you can make an offering to Mount Olivet United Methodist Church at our website. It's just that, mountolivetseaford.org. Um, or you can put a put a check in the mail or drop something off in the lockbox out by the side door, however um, works best for you. But please take a moment now and, and, and think about and pray about um, how you would like to respond to God in this moment.
us pray. Gracious God, thy word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path because your word illuminates the path that takes us forward into your purpose and into your promise. It is the way that we find your unending love. It is the way that we discover your faithful loving kindness. It is the way that we enter into your purpose and your purpose is that we should live and live abundantly, live in joy and live in peace in spite of the circumstances around us secure in our confidence in you, who you are, and what you can do. Lord, I pray in the week ahead that we will all be called to, to recalculate, not just once a week, but day by day by day, to remember, look around us and see, no, that's not the end. That's not all there is. To look back into your word and to rediscover everything that you promise and everything that you are, to find peace in this moment, to find grace in this moment, to find each other in this moment in new ways, to find you in this moment in new ways, to rediscover what it means to be your people in every moment and in every circumstance. We ask for your continuing protection for all those who are actively engaged in fighting back the enemy that has besieged us in this moment. We pray that you will protect them physically. We pray that you will protect their hearts and minds and spirits. And Lord, we pray that in ways that we cannot even begin to understand, that you will be with those who find themselves alone in this world, in this time, and in this place, the comfort that you can bring can heal hearts and minds and spirits. That's the gift that we ask for from you this morning, the gift of healing. Heal our minds, heal our hearts, heal our spirits, and reassure us that you are leading us into your purpose and into your kingdom and into the promise that we discover in the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to end today rather than start the day with a psalm this morning, Psalm 116, verses 12 through 19. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The Lord cares deeply when his loved ones die. O oh Lord, I am your servant. Yes, I am your servant, born into your household. You have freed me from my chains. I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the house of the Lord, in the heart of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen. When you have some time, if you have the, the printout of the worship, and it is on our Facebook page, 
um, look at the questions that are there. Think about the questions that we've raised together already this morning. In what part of my life do I believe that I'm living God's best purpose for right now? Is there a part of my life where I think that's not true? Um, and what can I do to discover and to welcome God's purpose for my life? And now, go in peace. Amen. Thank you.